Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute here. I have an exciting presentation to share to kick off World Oceans Day, announcing our Seaworthy Deep Dives, which I'll we'll discuss more in a moment here. Uh, but we are still just getting our morning going because this is our first ever, earliest ever panel, for sure, uh, here on the East Coast. Uh, there you are, Tamara. And in the meantime, uh, I will be sharing, I'll just jump in and get to our presentation while we wait for other speakers to join. So let me just jump in here. And basically, if you haven't celebrated World Oceans Day with us previously, uh, you know, we really love to use it as an opportunity to kind of share our audacious goals and well, for this World Oceans Day, we really reflect on not only our progress, but really look ahead. Uh, because out of any day to be excited about the ocean, it better be today. So uh, quick, very, very brain for seaworthy, you know, we think about these systemic change outcomes. And what that means is really affecting things on a community level, which helps us lead to solutions like you're going to hear today, that leads to the development of the ecosystems or basically systems of solutions. And so when we think about the impact that we create at seaworthy, we look at it as both a triple bottom line impact, but now leading to systemic change outcomes, right, on those systems levels. So social impact, economic impact, and environmental impact. And so what we're excited to announce today is our Seaworthy Deep Dives, which are basically these three overarching audacious goals that we're uh, excited to pursue that are really going to be both measurable and hit on both triple bottom line impact and systemic change outcomes by the end of 2030. And so the first one, uh, which I'm really passionate about, really just started from my own experience, is this really leading social impact into community outcomes so that every person that is passionate about ocean and climate impact is worthy of the opportunity to join our community and contribute to solutions. And so what that looks like, you know, is supporting 10,000 uh, ocean and climate impact entrepreneurs by the end of 2030 and reaching gender equality as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion with 50-50 female founders and founders from diverse backgrounds. And so where we're at right now is, as you can see, we have 47 uh, across two cohorts, and we are above 30% on both categories, which we're really proud of already, but still got more work to do. On the second side of economic impact leading to solutions outcomes, our real overarching goal is that every idea and solution that is viable, scalable, and value chain integrable is worthy of accessing support, resources, and capital. And so with that, our goal on the economic impact side is early stage grants impact investment reaching a billion dollars collectively across all of our startups by the end of 2030 and for the number of startups that we co-create or help grow uh, we would hit over three three thousand uh, by the end of 2030 and so currently we've helped raise over a hundred thousand dollars for our first cohort and currently helping our second cohort get investment ready and hit uh, 20 different solutions in the process and then finally our third and argue the biggest overarching goal is that every city and region that supports ocean and climate impact community and solutions is worthy of being part of the global blue tech and climate tech ecosystem. And so for that, that really is working across our six different verticals, which the impacts of which I've listed there, and at the same time scaling to new cities and regions and helping grow their blue tech and climate tech ecosystems. So that's hitting 500 startups per vertical, and reaching 50 cities and regions by the end of 2030. And currently we've already hit four plus startups per vertical and already have Miami and South Florida as our home base. And I just love to give the opportunity as well on World Oceans Day to give a shout out to our team who has been just an incredible driver of so many of the so much of the progress that you've already heard and what is going to enable us to achieve these massive goals over the next 10 years. And same thing with our advisors as well. If you haven't looked at them, everybody's on our about page. Uh, just really grateful for their help. So last but not least, I'm gonna leave you guys, leave you guys with a cliffhanger. Uh, we are gonna be working toward after the cohort announcing Seaworthy 3.0. And I've been kind of uh, teasing this for a while. Basically the way it's been is that, you know, the environment has been harnessed for capital generation. The way that we are looking forward is seeing how we can harness capitalism for environmental regeneration. So that's a little teaser for what's to come. But if you're not already on our Discord, uh, there's the link for that. And otherwise, I'm excited to jump in and introduce our startups. So with that, I see Tracy and Manuel here. There's Rosalie and Gareth. Hi, guys. Uh, I'd love to just have you guys jump in and introduce yourselves and what you're working on. Tracy and Manuel, how about we start with you guys? Okay. You want to get going, Manuel? Sure. Um, so, Daniel, is this our formal intro? Do we have yes. four minutes? 
Yes, you have four minutes or more. We, we, we only got two of you guys today. Okay, okay very good. Take your time. <laughs> Awesome. So yeah, love for the ocean means heartbreak these days as well, you know, and that's where I've been for uh, over 12 years. Um, I started um, working on plastic pollution a um, long time ago when the, the term didn't register in Google and nobody was working on it. And, you know, created a number of organizations such as Plastic Pollution Coalition that brings together over 200 NGOs and took me on a journey just to try and heal you know, what is going on and still going on very strongly in the ocean, the destruction of our marine ecosystems with plastic pollution. Um, I went on and started the UC Berkeley Circular Economy uh, online program and UCLA's, and now I teach uh, Circular and Regenerative Economics at Harvard. And along the road, um, you know, been working on different initiatives for profit and nonprofit. And you know, during this journey, we realized that what is needed now is not so much um, awareness, but action and giving businesses in particular uh, actionable pathways to, to do something about plastic pollution. There's lots and lots of businesses that will love to step in and change and leverage their amazing power of procurement to deplastify the world, but they don't know how, there's no data, there's no... There's no footprinting data for plastics, uh, but there's also no economic and business intelligence data around what it means really to eliminate single-use plastics. So that's where the idea of SUPER uh, came about. SUPER stands for Single-Use Plastic Elimination uh, Reduction. We are a nonprofit currently, hoping to um, launch a for-profit soon with the help of um, Seaworthy. And what we do is we make uh, plastic data visible and useful for single-use plastic reduction for businesses. And we do that through certifications and validation and um, technology. And uh, we launched in the, um, in the service industry, that is businesses that don't have a product, they just have offices. So we've been certifying workspaces basically. And for single-use plastic elimination of reductions, the way this works is we, um, take an assessment, we measure every single uh, every single single use plastic item that they use currently, and we um, give them a pathway for elimination uh, and reduction and a deadline, sort of like a sprint, then we measure again, and if, if they serve, we grant a certification process. In the case of offices, we look at four areas of employee activity, which is eating, drinking, working, but that's office supplies and gathering. But this is just one vertical. We hope to launch soon in, in many other verticals. Our certification is upstream, meaning we use the power of procurement, um, displacing the purchasing power from single-use plastics to something else. So we operate really in the prevention upstream. Uh, and also, we don't allow bioplastics and other substitutions. So we're really a systemic uh, change that we hope to, to influence. Right now, um, our technology is pretty basic. We have a, an MVP that works, that collects the data, that stores the data. We're hoping to, to be able to develop that a lot more so it becomes really scalable. And we have about 40, 40 offices with uh, 3,500 employees already certified in the US and the UK. Um, we got our first office in Australia and Bulgaria recently, and that already has a huge impact. We uh, track that to be 8.8 .8 million single-use plastic pieces eliminated per year and just those uh, with those just 3,500 people. Um, so that's a lot. And we're very excited to see metrics of impact and engagement and um, wonderful testimonials on our customers and so on. And we have already 80 more in the pipeline of these businesses. So I'll probably leave it there. Um, but that's us, that's super. You can visit us at super.ngo. Awesome. Thanks, Manuel. Tracy, do you have anything you want to add before we throw it to Rosalie and Garrett? No, um, I, I mean, not as far as super. Um, the only thing I will say is that I'm um, a proud um, participant co-founder of super with Manuel. It was his brainchild, and I met him through taking the circular economy course at UC Berkeley that he mentioned, and um, just so passionate about it. So to be honest, I actually um, have a lot of gratitude for being able to be in this space, be able to be on um, a webinar on World Oceans Day and being 
somebody who's participating in, in some in action for our oceans on our, our planet. So I, I, say my name because okay. I may have not done that. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Tracy. And I was just going to say, I feel like that just underscored, uh, you know, the first seaworthy deep dive we announced today, where it's just to say that, you know, everyone that has this passion should have the opportunity to do this kind of work because we, we need it. Um, so more power to you there. Uh, I will throw it over to Rosalie and Gareth to talk to us a little bit about Capital Swish. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so our company is called Capital Swish and we are a circular economy blue tech manufacturing company uh, compounding in of season fishing nets into technical compounds for the molding and 3D printing industries. So using our own structural compounds, we large scale 3D print a movable modular on water system for housing and commercial use. It's for buy to let um, for boutique hotels um, and can be moved easily as your family or your business needs grow. Um, so really, the we start with working with NGOs who collect the fishing nets. Um, then we compound that, uh, which we'll speak about a bit later in some of the questions. Um, and then we 3D print um, our own compounded product, a large scale 3D print. Um, and so what got us looking at um, and, and excited to do something in this space is when we found out that, uh, well, we found out about the big problem, which is um, ghost nets, which are those nets that are discarded in, in the oceans. And then they end up just continuing to catch ocean life, um, which then sinks to the bottom and those nets are released. And it's this big cycle that currently is killing about, five, about 650,000 creatures every year. And so we, looking at that as a as real ocean and human health risk. Um, and then also looking at uh, this, this concept of, of housing failure where the houses of current generations are, or past generations are not meeting the needs of current and future generations. They're too fixed and they, um, they're not adaptable enough for our, our changing um, environmental um, concerns that are happening with global warming. Um, and then in addition to that, we keep making a whole lot of virgin products and not using um, our waste. So uh, we we looking at sort of multiple solution um, products. So what we're going to, what we are doing is um, the nets and, and products from in water, we're taking those and compounding and then ending up with a product that floats on the water. And so, we're going to be, we'll be manufacturing um, plastic pellets out of the HDPE fishing nets, um, filaments for 3D printing, um, and then we're also, we're also um, manufacturing 3D modular system. Um, yeah, we've got some great contacts and deep tech uh, 3D partners. Um, yeah, some great companies that are already in the additive manufacturing space and small scale and large scale and in the, the machinery that, that we are going to be using. Um, and this uh, concept of 3D printing a, a modular house um, has been done, was done in 2016. It's not brand new. The, the idea of it is not brand new. And we know that it is possible in terms of what we're wanting to do with the 3D printing compound to be able to um, print modular housing. Um, yeah, and then the, in terms of the team of Gareth and I, why we are specifically suited to um, this business is we designed um, the business around the skills that we have and the experience that we have. Um, so we are unique to, uniquely uh, suited to founding Capital Switch. Gareth is a mechanical engineer with specialist compounding expertise. Uh, we both have executive level experience. My background is in architecture. I put myself through university and we are a very well balanced complementary founding team. And um, I focus on more of the, like an architect focuses on the long-term uh, problems and the, the sort of big vision. Um, and Gareth has more of the focus on the day-to-day -day, um, getting things under budget on time. Um, yeah, so together we, we complement each other very well there. Um, Previously, we successfully started and scaled a manufacturing business that prevented about 400 tons of industrial rubber from going to landfill monthly. And so we know how to work with organizations for closed loop or circular processing um, and the manufacturing of consistent quality um, critical products. 
So Capital Swish is based in South Africa, we'll be exporting globally, and we are currently actively looking for investors and advisors. All right, well, thank you both. So if you guys haven't heard today, we are talking about upstream and, and downstream plastic value chain building. And you know, what that means and what you guys have heard of these solutions is basically upstream, meaning getting ahead of things getting into the ocean in the first place or plastic specifically. And downstream, as what Rosalie and Gareth are doing, helping to remove it from the water and actually sequestrate solutions. And so today we're going to jump into some predetermined questions. And then from there, we'll have a Q&A for the last 15 minutes or so. So uh, if you have any questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat. Also, you're more than welcome to introduce yourself in the chat as well. So with that, I'm going to jump into our first question, which I will throw over to Tracy and Manuel, which is, how do you see upstream or downstream plastic pollution reduction and removal evolving as a blue tech sector? Uh, well, it's, um, you know, exponential. We have, uh, you know, our brain has a problem to understand exponential functions. And some people say that that's the biggest uh, problem with the human race. And if there is something growing exponentially, that's plastic pollution in the ocean. And we know where it's coming from and we know how it gets there. And we know it's coming from single use plastic packaging upstream. And we know that we need exponential solutions. So downstream solutions are, are essential to keep those beaches clean, to uh, bring the awareness, to stop it uh, from, from you know, harming ecosystems. But ultimately, I think um, a lot more has to be done in terms of prevention and stopping. And that's where you have, you know, a, a big lever to really change the system. Because unless we change the system, ultimately, um, it would just, in the ocean, trying to clean it up, it'll be like Sisyphus, you know, uh, pushing the boulder out of the rock. So how I see played out in the future is we have an exponential problem and it's going to get much worse than we think quicker. Uh, there's a movie that just launched for World Oceans Day, Pull Out Plastic. Watch it if you can. Um, as P-U-L-A-O, Plastic, uh, actually you, P-U-L-A-U, Plastic is in uh, Netflix. And it shows you just a quick snapshot of what's going on in Indonesia, for example. So we need to do this as a, as a humanity. And, you know, changes in procurement, taxation, um, you know, um, extended producer responsibility, all of the, the exponential tools in the book have to come into place. Tracy, anything else you want to add to that? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. Normally I do, but that was very well covered in my opinion, so. <laughs> How Thank about you guys, Rosalie and Gareth? Same question. <laughs> Okay, um, you want me to do that? Uh, firstly, for material to be valued and not dumped um, on landfill or dis discarded at sea, there needs to be equal volume uh, for profit upstream draw. Um, this is something we, we believe very strongly about. Um, discarded end of season fishing nets is a large volume problem. About 275,000 tons of nets are manufactured globally every year to replace the end of season nets, and those old nets have to go somewhere. So. It's, it's a big problem and it needs a big draw to balance it. And then secondly, blue tech sector is multidisciplinary, uh, which is really exciting and promising part because the real solutions can come from anywhere. Um, as soon as we bring sort of seemingly disconnected experience and expertise together and start to see the problem waste, it actually is the resource that it is. Um, so we see much the massive potential for recycle, technical, 3D large scale printed compounds for blue tech application physical objects, um, in addition to our 3D printed housing. So anything that can be 3D printed out of, well, out of concrete or actually molded in fiberglass uh, with glass fiber reinforced resins could potentially be large scale 3D printed um, from bespoke recipe um, net compound that we manufacture. So uh, using recycled HDPE allows us to increase the cost viability of large scale structural 3D printing, um, which previously was cost prohibitive. Um, and so that's no longer the case. And, and we think it's got, yeah, um, many, many applications within blue tech because, um, because you're printing with um, material and a 3D printer, there's, you know, there is work to, to shift design to be able to 3D print something different. Um, but 
it's quite easy to to swap between those if your if your modular manufacturing is based on on 3d printing here's anything else you want to add before we go to the next question oh you're on mute <laughs> no i think I, I think the only thing i add i think at the moment it seems that ngos are probably the only ones who are doing anything sort of valuable in the in the ocean space and trying to sort out issues so i think to try and get industry or for-profit companies into it is the only way it's going to get any better at scale yeah yep. the long-term big solutions yeah well and, and i think this really underscores and I think it beautifully leads into some of our next questions. Um, you know, really, this is about creating an economic driver for impact, right? And I think so much of what we've seen historically, Gareth, Gareth, your point, is that this has been philanthropic efforts and philanthropy hasn't really been scalable. Otherwise, it would have really fixed things by now. Um, and so we need these really innovations and solutions that can scale and create actual return on impact and investment um, to really help us drive this you know, solve these problems at scale. So with that being said, I think one of the key points to that is how we integrate with other solutions, right? And how we actually really build out, um, you know, not just one single bottom line benefits, but these really multifaceted impacts. Uh, so I'll throw it back to Manuel and Tracy. What are some of the benefits of your technologies beyond addressing plastic pollution? Beyond addressing plastic pollution? Well, it's incredibly engaging and connects everybody to the ocean. You know, how can we connect? There's a lot of people who don't even think about the ocean, even people who live in coastal cities. And that's a big problem. You know, we, we live with our backs turned on the ocean, except for occasional recreation, things like that. This is a way to, to be specifically connected to the ocean in your daily actions. This is a way to show love for the ocean and, and be a part of the solution. Um, regardless of who you are. So that connection, I think is, is going to be super important. We're already seeing huge level of engagement because when you eliminate single use plastics from your business, from your life, um, that feels good and it's transformative. So it's, an, it's something we can all do. You know, Some people feel powerless with full of eco anxiety. Um, we are giving people a way to be a part of the solution. So we finding a lot of thank you notes and people really appreciating uh, that um, as well. And beyond that, our technology is going to capture all, a lot of data that is now invisible in the economy. Wasted plastic is also wasted money. We're hoping to um, support the emerging marketplace of startups and solutions of for single-use plastic. So. We hope our technology becomes an enabler, a matchmaking. So imagine like, <laughs> I just thought of it like a Tinder, massive Tinder for solutions for better procurement that allows you know everybody to find a better procurement solution. So that's what we're hoping. I can add a few to this one. All right. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm more of the, the client facing person in, in, in our duo. Um, but there's actually quite a few things in addition to the engagement um, and in fact the sort of treasure hunt aspect because sadly it is kind of hard to find um, is is the marketplace and um, it's it's any any new product that we can share with our clients is is sort of this um, really exciting moment of some something else. It's like this new this new and shiny thing. Oh, maybe people will start standing in line someday, like for a new Apple come out of of a SoFi um, new paper product for the <laughs> for drinking or something, but. Um, but yeah, so there's that, the element of this sort of treasure hunt of finding those um, solutions, um, because I, I would say from my experience, uh, really everybody says, I, I'm happy to be involved, but how? And we're so caught up in our day-to-day -day, and we go to the same place, we buy the same things and, um, and we're all kind of overwhelmed. So to be able to hand um, people a solution that in, in just literally, you don't need to buy this, you can buy this. Um, people are, are, are happy to do that to the extent that they can. Um, from a business perspective, in addition to what Manuel mentioned, the cost savings of reuse 
um, not not um, just throwing your money away literally um, with the the use and toss items that we all have everywhere. Um, but another element that I've seen from a um, from a leadership perspective is that those people that it it really separates the wheat from the shaft. This this um, process that we go through of those people that are creative, out of the box thinkers, and those that are just kind of committed to doing the same thing that it's always been done. And um, so that, that's been kind of an interesting sort of add on to this where, um, you know, those, those folks that really do well with this project are those that you can see within your company um, are, are ready to be your next generation leaders in other areas other than sustainability. And then frankly, um, you know, it may be kind of not so uh, exciting to say this, but from a marketing perspective, um, you, you know, over 60% of um, consumers say that their decisions for purchasing are based on their, their values. And I don't think any business wants to be on the other side of that. So um, if you're, you're um, walking the talk and you're, and you're making decisions within your business operations that make a difference to the world, you are um, able to present that out to the world and, and hopefully take a better share of of the market so those are kind of just add-ons there awesome well i i think it's oh, there, there's just so many opportunities and I, I love to reference triple bottom line impact as part of this right and i think a big piece that i look at what you guys do is take and i put it in the chat as well go from you know awareness and education all the way to actually driving solutions so i'm um, just with all of that. Uh, so Rosalie and Garrett, same question for you guys. You know, what are some of the benefits of your technologies beyond just addressing plastic pollution? Okay, so even just looking at the economic value um, in terms of the appeal, the appeal of a near and limited high strength thermoplastic raw material supply. So this is just the, the raw material that's available uh, currently in the oceans um, and that it's that is currently being dumped. Um, so in the form of end of use fishing nets, um, it's a stable, reliable supply that is great for manufacturing stability. So already it's, it's sort of presenting itself as a great raw material source. Uh, then you add the fact that um, the use of recycled material helps replace more of the virgin material. Um, so that's the greenhouse gas emissions, um, which we've worked out is, is about half of the equivalent virgin HDP um, greenhouse gas emissions. Then you add the fact that you diverting, uh, by diverting nets, you help protect the ocean life. So it won't end up as dust gear. Um, so that can help save um, some of the 650,000 creatures that die in ghost nets every year. Um, and then we add uh, to that that the nets that we compound, we use in 3, 3D printing, um, a new way to live and deal with climate challenges and uncertainty. So to be resilient, uh, you need to be able to adapt um, and the fixed rigid forms of housing that suited past generations just don't suit us and our, our future the generational needs now. Um, so we've had a glimpse of that um, this need for freedom within the tiny house movement and during the pandemic when people are, or have been looking for ways to live more uh, self-sufficiently um, and many people are looking at doing that on the water. Um, and this, this trend is visible um, at the, with the growth of the modular movable markets and the floating house markets that are growing at an amazing rate, um, expected to grow by more than 50% over the next five years. So people are desperate for housing solutions that provide real freedom um, and are self-sufficient, simple and affordable. Um, it's also for us with the, the possibilities of 3D printing something that is actually affordable. Um, it means that yeah, the new generations who don't want to be tied to massive property debt for the rest of their lives um, can have another, another option. Well, and I, I think this is one of the really cool things about what you guys are building is, you know, we talk about building the value chain, right? And it, whether it's in the last in our last cohort who was using a boat to collect seaweed and a biorefinery to process them, or now you guys who are creating not only this compounding or way to compound nets and then turn them into houses, right? We're thinking about how we integrate these things. And for those who don't know the value chain, it really is about going from the raw problem or product, right? Like 
plastic or seaweed to an end solution that you are sequestering or really creating something that is going to keep it out of the water, right? Um, and that really brings me to the next question, which I will throw back to Rosalie and Gareth. So at Seaworthy, we talk about these building these systems of solutions that work together and really synergistically build regenerative blue economies, right? And connect the dots of just how we can actually collaborate. So my question to you guys is, how do you see your technology working uh, coordination with other solutions? Um, so at Capital Switch, we believe that um, connecting the end of season discarded nets volume to construction is a way that we can achieve that scale of that draw needed uh, to solve the global problem of the nets in the ocean. Um, so we work with NPOs or, or not NGOs um, who collect the discarded nets and clean them. Um, that in itself is, is creating a lot of job opportunities, um, especially you know, for the, the African continent. Um, and this is how we first came up with the idea of compounding nets into 3D printable compound that can be large scale 3D printed. Um, so that, yeah, the nets, as you said, the nets in the water become housing on the water. Um, it's a huge vision, but it's, connect, uh, it's connected from one end to the other. So that creates a, a true blue circular economy value chain. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> No wrong answers. Yeah. <laughs> Jason Manuel, how about you guys? Well, when we're entering, in, um, I mean, this, the uh, blue uh, regenerative economy it needs to be measured, needs to be monitored, needs to be based on a metrics. And um, right now, there's no metrics about one of the main um, uh, problems that are facing our oceans, which is uh, plastics and microplastics and plastic fibers and all of the other dimensions that that problem has. And the way we see ourselves playing in is being part of the dashboards that are, um, more and more people uh, are using and will be using to make decisions, but also to, to enforce legislation, to enforce taxation, uh, et cetera, uh, to um, um, enforce extended producer responsibility. So being a part of all those dashboards, providing um, a, a data stream that right now is not available would be awesome. Also allowing others that participate in this economy make the right purchasing and procurement decisions as they go along. Otherwise, it would be ironic that you're participating in this economy and supporting businesses or processes that are polluting to our oceans. So we, we foresee a, a big environmental data revolution that is already, we're already seeing and would apply to the oceans. Um, that's also in coming and, and much needed. And we see ourselves just playing a role there and synergizing with all other solutions. Tracy, anything else you wanna to add to that one? Oh, you're on mute. I was going to say Manuel does cover things well. <laughs> well, I'll just say I think it's on both sides. You know, when we think about things, I think most people think about plastic pollution for the ocean and downstream, right? Because that is the negative impact that we see. But I love to reference Manuel, a stat that you shared with me that, you know, it's 80% of the plastic we can prevent from getting into the ocean in the first place from upstream. And so as we think about building out these value chains and creating collaboration across these different uh, technologies, it really is this collaborative effort that's going to drive forward just how we scale these things. And, you know, I think whether it's co-working spaces or creating housing, um, you guys are really hitting the nail on the head on both sides. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to you, Manuel and Tracy, and this is a perfect segue to our next question. How do you see your solutions and these systems of solutions really scaling to drive broader ocean and climate impact? Well, we see... Um... We see the, the data stream of um, just being understanding what is the single use plastic footprint of anything. You know, um, we see that being scaled to a lot, a lot of verticals. So that's one of the beautiful things about what we're doing that is applicable and beautiful and also sad that we're so tied to single use plastics and for every human activity. But there is uh, countless economic sectors where we can deploy and we just targeting, happen to be targeting workspaces, which is a great learning opportunity, a place to be uh, right now. But um, food retail is a huge uh, opportunity and uh, consumer packaged goods is a huge opportunity. And, and all of the activities that happen in around uh, the ocean are huge opportunities. So 
scalability and uh, new frontiers is not a problem for us. It's rather the opposite. We need to um, make a conscious effort to be really focused to gain the traction we want to gain. But um, we hope that you know your single-use plastic footprint becomes something as important as your carbon footprint. You know, moving forward, it's like okay, you're going to do activity X or buy product X. Okay, what's the footprint um, in terms of CO two? What's the footprint in terms of single-use plastics? And uh, and I was going to say, you know, I think the the key thing is just when we think about data. I think a lot of people, especially in this space, haven't had the opportunity for data to have value. Um, and I know Manuel and I have already gone gone uh, over and beyond on this, but I also would love to just see. Web3 as a potential major driver as well, uh, without going deep, deep down that rabbit hole. So, uh, <laughs> Jay-Z, if you don't have anything else to add, I'll throw it over to Rosalie and Gary. Go ahead. Okay, so... <laughs> Go ahead, Rosalie, Gary. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I'll answer it from the compounding side. So generally, when people are recycling plastics, they're taking the raw plastics and they're just melting it down and repelletizing it into a pellet form that can be reused. And when you do that, you get varying properties because you've got mixed plastics that are coming through. You've got different um, grades of plastics or polymers that are mixed together. So generally, if that goes into industry, it's not a good source for them to use because you get these varying properties in your production process. So industry doesn't like to use that type of recycled product unless it's for very low value items or low spec items. Um, so because we're wanting to focus on a single source being the net, so you have a stable supply of one polymer um, and we wanting to compound it into a technical product uh, by adding things like UV stabilizers and antioxidants, um, yeah, process aids, things like that. We're focusing on producing a technical compound that can then be used for technical products in industry. So once you we were able to build up the trust with the um, customers who would use it, there's a big scope for them to start replacing Virgin with that recycled product. So I think that's that's a big issue or a, a big draw that would then come from that material. Um, yeah, and then once you take it to the 3D printed side, I think there's a huge market there because at the moment, there's very little recycled material that goes into 3D printing. So if we can develop a technical 3D printable material that works just as well as a virgin or very close to a virgin material, there's a huge scope for that to be um, scalable as well. Well, I think it's you know interesting when we think about the, again, getting back to the value chain perspective on this too, because it really is not only scaling systems of solutions for themselves as, as individual value chains, but how we can holistically scale them, right? And, Scale, scale these systems and not just these individual solutions. Um, I'm going to move on to our last question, which is our, our little softball, uh, especially for people who are thinking about hopefully being in your shoes as part of our next cohort. Um, what advice do you have for current and aspiring blue and climate tech entrepreneurs looking to fight plastic pollution with innovation? And I'll throw it back to Manuel and Tracy. Just follow your passion and be ready to be you know, a dreamer um, in a world where, you know, the changes are accelerating very quickly and you are be surrounded by more and more and more packaging and plastic. There is hope, uh, connect, uh, stay grounded in community, uh, stay grounded in, in networking and connecting with those who share your vision uh, to change the world because it's, it's really what it is. We've built a plasticized world as part of the Anthropocene is the synthetic materials and um, you know, we need to bring awareness, change it uh, for the future. And I would say that my advice is stay really grounded in, in your vision, uh, which is a world that is quite different from the world today, but it's possible and it's happening and we're making it uh, closer to us every single day. 
totally agree. The grounding in your passion and you know, just knowing your North Star is a key point and persistence on that too. Tracy, anything else to add there? No, I mean that because I it, it's a roller coaster. So um, so be bold um, and um, and and I, I think the community aspect and and get being kind of getting yourself able to go back um, because you're going to be disappointed by so many things um, on the journey and you just have to you just have to know that and feel comfortable it's the right path and and keep going on it <laughs> intuitiveness uh, it's one of my all-time favorite words um, I think it was a uh, oh gosh I don't remember if it was Thomas Edison or Jefferson but one of them I came up that word uh, Rosalie and Gareth how about you guys um so yeah I, I would maybe say um part of part of sometimes why big problems are not solved is because um uh, industries and experience and even even people are kind of siloed into the areas um and so like uh, I'll example here is usually like net plastic would be melted apart from those with expert plastic compounding experience because you don't think that those two worlds should normally meet but that's kind of exactly sometimes what's needed to drive something forward where, where there's been a block so I think being open to the idea of working with people who you think might be on the other side of the environmental um more the other side of the environmental scale to you um because they are good people within every industry <laughs> so you can find those who will share your passion um and then yeah use your unique experience and skill set um and find people to balance and complement you which is really really important in a startup um, and my favorite quote is from mother Teresa, which says you can do what i cannot do i can do what you cannot do and together we can do great things so it's about multidisciplinary, all of that stuff. Gareth, anything you want to add as well? Um, no, not really. I think pretty much just what Tracy said as well is that it does get very hard. So you need to just try and be resilient and stick with it. I, I think the, and this is again, you know, reinforcing some of what I, I really truly believe with Seaworthy too, it, it is, this power of community that you know you realize you guys are not alone in uh, taking this crazy journey of entrepreneurship and pursuing your passion and trying to build a game-changing solution and the more we surround ourselves with those other people the more we realize uh, that we're not alone in that journey and that we need as many of as many tracy's manuel's rosalie and garris as possible if we're going to fix uh fix our planet so daniels and tamaris and everybody else like you started with this great <laughs> presentation and you laid it out like that initial presentation was he worthy to us i think that's that's it right there that's where we need more of so thank you well it is out of any day a day for audacious thinking i liked uh, your comment in the chat very well and speaking of comments in the chat we are going to shift over to our q a so i will throw it over to sarah to unmute to ask her question and feel free to keep getting those questions in the chat if you have any we have room for a couple thanks daniel hey everyone good morning um Nice to meet you all and excited to be hearing about your companies. Um, so in thinking about the plastic industry, it seems firstly very large and secondly, very capital heavy. Um, and you all are taking that head on, but what are some of the biggest barriers that you have faced, um, barriers to entry, obstacles you've had to overcome um, related to the plastic value chain or the industry as a whole? Right. So my gosh, since I've been dealing Go with these, yeah. guys, these guys for, for the longest. So I've been dealing with these guys, you know, since I encountered Dow Chemical and Coca-Cola in, you know, you know, in 2008 and nine, where they were um, intent, for instance, in the term plastic pollution not happening. It, it, the term then was marine debris. Uh, so it's they're very strategic. Just the American Chemistry Council, which is the U.S part of the of the industry has a um, you know um, it's close to 100 million budget uh, you know huge salaries i mean here we are the ngos having like a cookie sale 
uh, to, to, you know, do our projects. And these guys are big players. Um, also, just the plastic industry right now is investing $180 billion worldwide in new plastic manufacturing plants. Think about that. That's half the GDP of Greece. So if you think of head-on collision, is 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 not useful. Um, the the main obstacle and the way they operate is actually they uh, just push the same pet solutions that they've been pushing for decades, which is oh well, don't worry about this. Um, technology will come and save the day. You don't need to change your business model. You just keep do it business as usual. And they play with something called the moral hazard. The moral hazard it happens when um, somebody tells you that there is a solution for your problem, even if that solution is coming in a thousand years or a hundred years, or it's a pie in the sky. Um, it's a behavioral, it's been studying behavior that will actually diminish your pressure to do something. So they're super smart and they've been just focusing on, you know, diverting the attention to solutions that are not working. Um, so in terms of, you know, pushback, it's really that that discourse they have and then we have our discourse like we need to stop plastic pollution you know we we mm -hmm. we need to to just stop that and and that is the main the main thing in terms of pushback from our customers or from uh individual businesses no we don't get that we get the opposite people are really up to here with with the situation and just excited that you give them an, an avenue to do something so um yeah I'll actually um, adjust Manuel's comment a little bit in that I'm surprised at some of the pushback that we get. Um, we get people who are committed to the fact that something they have says it's compostable. And when I explain all of the problems with that, they just don't want to hear it <laughs> because they've made these purchases that makes them feel good. And I am just not helping <laughs> them with the pesky facts. <laughs> um, recycling is still something where people are just so committed to as a, a thing that they can do. And we, you know, again, when you kind of give facts about how it's not really, you know, Manuel refers to it as wish cycling, we're only sorting. Um, and then you're hoping um, that, that your, your stuff gets a chance. <laughs> a second chance at life. Um, so we do get pushback. And then of course the the industry or the, the single the plastics industry is so huge. I have to admit that um I have not been trolled on any level. Um, you know, little comments here or there, but not in any and I I will know I've arrived when someday I am um I'm out there enough and big and bold enough that I'm on somebody's um somebody's list to to troll. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope it's coming. It'll be hard, but I hope it's coming. But I know it's it's just, you know, it's, it's massive and, and the capital involved um, is is so big that um, people have to, there's going to be people, you know, holding their turf and fighting wherever they can to keep it. I was like, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, so I think from the compounding side, the biggest hurdle is even though we're looking at a technical product from our side, when people hear of the background and where it's coming from, they automatically have like a preconceived idea of a recycled compound or recycled material and what it normally, um, the normal properties and processing, all that is, comes along with that. Which would be low speak. Yeah. So I think the biggest hurdle is trying to get that mind shift in, the, in in industry and having to build up the trust with the companies that we can provide a technical product with um, recycle content. Recycle content, yeah, with uh, with good stable properties. Um, so it's yeah, I think trust is a good a big thing on that side. So you don't. So in other words, our clients won't have to choose one or the other. They can actually get a great product at a good price that does something good for the environment as well. Um, and part of, uh, you know, these are when, you, when you're thinking about um, molding companies, companies that are making products out of out of plastic, um, those companies 
need to know that the you know they 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 are using huge volumes and they need to know that the quality of the material that they use is uh, able to to be the same for the first batch of product and the last one and um, otherwise that gives them a huge 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 headaches and so trust is a big thing that uh, we have to build with our clients but it's a bit of a cart before the horse thing because they have to trust us a bit in the first place for <laughs> for us to have the opportunity to to build more of that trust so um there is a bit of of time that goes into building those relationships but uh more from our side we've really got a lot of relationships with some of our products that we are going to be compounding to start with um and so we can build on those relationships and then at least we get a foot in the door so um, and I just want to make a differentiation here between the plastics that uh, Super is talking about and the ones that we're dealing with, because that might confuse people. Um, the plastics that we're looking at are multiple use, not single use plastics. So this is, you know, the plastics that um, go into those everyday items that you use a lot um, that are lightweight and um, would potentially actually take more energy to, to make out of something else. So the the products that we want to be taking nets and making those taking those nets and compounding and making them into other products those are products that will have a long life and the properties of plastic uh, work for those products so yeah I just wanted to clear that up <laughs> awesome um, well I will throw it to Sylvia who only had a, a couple questions there Sylvia you want to unmute and ask your question oh thanks so much I appreciate it, guys. Great work today. All right. Uh, a couple questions. Um, I've just, you know, I've been moving towards circularity for a while, but I was reading an article just yesterday that talks about uh, this, which I think somebody was alluding to earlier. The vision of circular, a uh, circular economy is basically uh, impossible um, from, from, from what they were proposing in, in this document. I'll share it with you later, Daniel, um, so you can share it with them. But uh, so there was a little bit of things of like, how do we, you know, so that, that sort of in terms of philosophically, even getting to a circularity and the, and, and sort of the quant, the physics of, of using more energy to turn the waste into the value stream is one thing. And I think obviously you guys have an upstream approach, which, which is another um, that's more relevant, I think, to, to get to the root of the issue. So to get to the, to get to the root of the question, uh, how can we, how can we take steps necessary in a place like Miami, Miami-Dade County? or other places like Louisiana, uh, Alabama, where we're um, discharging a lot into our bays, like Tampa, et cetera. It, it, are there any immediate, immediate wins or best practices or a playbook even? And this is something that I would really encourage you to, to create if you haven't already, so that we can give to uh, local uh, politicians and policymakers so that there is a general set of best practices and best policies that we can enact, right? Um, and help you sort of lay the groundwork for whatever your own solutions might look like. And so, so I guess is how do we make this practical? How do we make it easy to adopt? And how do we bring this to Miami in a way that doesn't leave people scratching their heads and makes it very clear to go from A to Z? Great question. I don't envy you guys. Well, um, great question, multiple layers. I mean, is security a pipe dream? No. Um, we right now we have um, only eight percent of the materials in our economy are um, reused in one way or the other. So that means that um, you know most ninety two percent of the value in our economy gets destroyed. That's uh, just something. Um, whether there is a theoretical, physical, entropy driven impossibility to get into a hundred percent, sure. But hello, we are in ninety two percent opportunity. You know, so there's a, a, an amazing room for improvement that's real, that's needed, that's inevitable. Uh, in terms of playbooks, uh, there is the, the greatest global agreement after the Paris Agreement on any environmental issue is happening now at the United Nations level, and they're working on a global treaty to stop plastic pollution. So, and, and Tracy and I have been part of the global dialogues and the country dialogues as well for that treaty. And... It, so there's a playbook at the United Nations, UNEP. There's a playbook for at the World Economic Forum. There's playbooks at national level. There's playbooks in the forms of uh, national plastic pacts that are being fostered by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So there's a lot of playbooks. And basically, 
the, the, the general idea is A, eliminate not necessary plastics and plastics that have been designed to become waste. There's plastic ghost nets, for instance, are not designed to become waste. They're be design nets are designed to last a long time. The problem is they end up in the environment polluting. Um, but there is a lot of plastics that we don't really need. All those sachets, all the straws, all the plastic packaging, all the layers there. So that's the first focus, eliminate unnecessary plastic. And right now, it's staggering, but 40% of all plastic produced is used to make garbage basically it's packaging so there's a huge lever right there and then you know there's other tiers to this okay then let's create a value and purity for plastic so there is um, a value chain uh, afterwards you know if you attach value and purity to something then it gets put back into the economy right now plastics don't have a lot of value at the end of life there's exceptions like polypropylene in ghost nests that's valuable you can do stuff with it. Uh, so that's what our colleagues are doing. So, you know, it's not one thing, it's multiple, uh, multi-pronged approaches. And I'll stop there because I could go on forever. So, Yeah, I think that was, a great, that was a great point. Thanks, Manuel. Is it Rosalind Garrett or Tracy, you guys have anything else to add? All right. Well, I know we only have three minutes left, so I want to make sure uh, we first take a chance to thank our panelists. Uh, really enjoyed the discussion today, uh, and what better day to do it than World Oceans Day, so thank you guys so much. Thank you all for the great questions. Um, if you didn't get to see the deep dives at the beginning of the presentation, we'll be posting them on our blog later today. Um, other than that, uh, I encourage uh, Rosalie Gareth, uh, Tracy and Manuel, if you haven't already, definitely put your info in the chat for anyone to reach out. Because uh, I know we have some great, great folks here who I'm sure are looking to collaborate. And uh, beyond that, uh, in two weeks from today, we will have our next panel. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. I'm actually going to put the link in the chat here. So uh, if you'd like to attend, our next one is going to be on carbon dioxide removal, coast resilience, and, uh, and Web3. So all that being said, uh, I'm just really thankful for everyone coming out to kick off their World Oceans Day morning with us. And if you have any other questions, uh, we're happy to hang out for a minute or two here. Um, other than that, I hope everyone goes and enjoys their World Oceans Day. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye, guys. Have so a good much day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Stay off plastic. Don't use plastic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good meeting, Manuel. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Great job.